start uh, welcoming everyone to our panel on institutional perspectives um, what, uh, going forward. So uh, we have uh, Dr. Gerson uh, Moreno Riano, who is Executive Vice President of Academic Affairs at Regent University. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Adam Kissel, who is Executive Vice President, no, he, excuse me, bleh, who is Cardinal Institute Senior Fellow, excuse me, I was re misreading that. And then Amy Wax, who is Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania. And I, if, I'm, if that's a named professorship, please excuse me if I'm forgetting that. She's also a member of uh, the NAS Board of Directors. I'm delighted to have the three of you here. And uh, I believe uh, Dr. Uh, Moreno Riano uh, would speak first. Uh, Dr. Moreno, uh, 20 minutes each and then the usual Q&A. Well, I would start by saying colleges and universities are some of the most important social institutions in America. These institutions have the privilege of educating large segments of future generations of Americans who will advance or undermine the American way of life that has been bequeathed to them. These same institutions also have the greatest longevity of any other institution Americans have created. Before 1776, there were a total of 18 universities in America, all of which are still in operation. Current estimates suggest that there are over 4,000 colleges and universities in America spending over $600 billion educating close to 20 million students. America's colleges and universities are thus foundational sources of cultural influence based on their vast reach extensive resources, educational purpose, and historical transcendence. It is not an exaggeration to state that the condition of America's institutions of higher education have a significant influence upon the future and well-being of American society. But there's trouble in American higher education. So my presentation focuses on the concerns related to the moral corruption of America's college students caused by a viral anti-intellectualism spreading throughout American higher education. This anti-intellectualism is manifested through an unexamined rejection of Western civilization's moral tradition and its embodiment in America's founding vision and principles, and an unexamined embrace of the moral traditions of other civilizations and people groups as new foundational pillars for American society. Intellectualism involves a rigorous and fair assessment of assumptions, first principles, methods, and consequences of any argument, tradition, or culture. In both the rejection of the West and the embrace of the other, such intellectualism is absent. Now, this anti-intellectualism or lack of serious intellectual inquiry can lead to the advance of falsehoods masquerading as truth and knowledge. This anti-intellectualism has been well documented in the scholarship and practice of higher education. And it should be noted that this anti-intellectualism is not just a mere academic squabble among academicians. The incomplete and incoherent views of reality, as well as the falsehoods advanced by such anti-intellectualism in academia, are having terrifying real-world consequences for America, given the influence of its universities upon the moral formation of today's students. So in what follows, I want to speak briefly about this malady of anti-intellectualism anti in America's colleges and universities, along with one of its most recent consequences, the creation of the anti-American anarchic curricula to educate student revolutionaries. Now, it would be a grave mistake, I think, to consider this consequence as a temporal outlier never to be seen again. Now, in my concluding comments, I want to introduce a high-level blueprint that can serve as an impetus for reform and revival in American higher education. So let me speak about the problem. America's colleges and universities have always positioned themselves as the bastions of knowledge and truth for the moral formation of, of their students. Regardless of intellectual debates surrounding the meaning of such terms as knowledge, truth, and moral, universities in America have never rejected their implicit commitment to moral formation. American higher education is replete with examples illustrating the commitment of colleges and universities to the imperative of moral formation. Now consider, for example, the following abridged mission or vision statements of some of America's leading colleges and universities. Harvard commits itself to educating citizen leaders through a commitment to the transformative power of liberal education. The University of Virginia serves the nation by developing responsible citizen leaders. Arizona State University assumes the fundamental responsibility for the well-being and health of the communities it serves. MIT seeks to develop in students 
the ability to work wisely for the betterment of mankind. Now, beyond the institutional commitments to research, scholarship, and diversity, it is clear that one of the most fundamental goals of American higher education is the moral formation of students, a formation that presupposes a commitment to a particular moral core. But we should ask whether this moral core actually provides a sound moral formation and education to America's students. Considering the $600 billion investment in American higher education, what type of human beings are our colleges and universities cultivating for the good of the nation? Uh, to start, the sound moral formation of any human being involves a commitment to a worldview that accurately and correctly defines the true, beautiful, and good. And by extension, any educational institution whose aim is sound moral formation must have a concomitant commitment to such a moral view that is at its core, true, beautiful, and good. Consequently, sound moral formation and education is sound to the degree that it corresponds to what is genuinely true, beautiful, and good. However, not all moral formation and education is sound. Examples abound of moral formation and education that lead to the creation of cultures with wicked practices and the cultivation of human beings that think, feel, and act wickedly. That which is ultimately and metaphysically true, beautiful, and good is the universal standard that rightly measures the soundness of moral formation and education. From this universal standard flow the virtues that are necessary for the formation of an American human being situated in our liberal democratic constitutional republic. And dedication to these virtues is a lifeblood of our American democracy. Now this argument I think runs against the grain of many American academics who believe that there is no universal truth and therefore that truth is the function of human experience and not a fundamental metaphysical characteristic outside of human experience. This perspective was heralded in America through the philosophy known as pragmatism and its devotees, Charles Pierce, William James, and John Dewey. Now, pragmatism and its heralds have had a profound influence on the intellectual trajectories of American higher education. The rejection of a transcendent and universal true, beautiful, and good led to the relegation of the true, beautiful, and good to mere creations of human experience to be changed as desired or demanded. Absent universal truth, the ultimate reality is a moldable human experience that requires the freedom and power to act upon it and to change it. Now, as William James writes in Pragmatism, and I quote, a pragmatist turns away from abstraction, from fixed principles and pretended absolutes. He turns toward concreteness, toward action and towards power. The pragmatic method is a program for more work, particularly as an indication of the ways in which existing realities may be changed. There is no doubt that the current revolutionary ethos, counter to the foundational civic virtues in American higher education and its students, is deeply rooted both in a rejection of a universally existing truth and an acceptance of the malleability of reality through power, action, and change. American colleges and universities that morally form and educate their students within this pragmatic context subvert their moral and educational mission. So what, what does this subversion look like? I think for answers, we can look at the vanishing West. I think one of the most comprehensive reports published by the National Association of Scholars back in 2011 concerning the moral core of American higher education, the study of America's received moral tradition. In universities across the country, this moral core has often been embedded in university core courses that explore Western civilization and American history. In the Vanishing West report, it was observed that in the early 1960s, 10 of the top 50 U.S. universities mandated a Western civilization course. By 2011, however, none of these schools and only one of the 75 public universities mandated such a course. The report also discovered that American history courses had virtually disappeared from general education requirements at our colleges and universities. The authors concluded that America's heir had become, quote, largely blinded to its history, unquote. Apparently, historical blindness had become an educational condition of the moral core of American higher education. This historical blindness was, however, selective in nature. The report also noted that world history was in the process of superseding Western history as the preferred non-American history survey course and even as a scholarly specialization. Now, if it is true that a society studies what it values, then American colleges and universities were the first American institutions to devalue their own history and civilizational foundations 
in pursuit of a more fitting history and tradition. Now, I think it's important to emphasize that there is more at stake than just a devaluing of the received moral tradition of the West in America and its substitution by other moral traditions. Western civilization and its embodiment in America are both rooted in the very things American pragmatists and many American intellectuals and academics deny. A commitment to truth, beauty, and goodness expressed through a fundamental belief in the reality and existence of God, a universal truth that transcends human experience, the principle that humanity possesses rights and freedoms that also transcend human experience, and the principle that humanity can be held accountable to a universal moral code. Western civilization and the American tradition are thus unique and exceptional in the history of humankind because of their commitment to someone and something greater than themselves, God and truth. It is only when the West and America have deviated from this foundational commitment that the West and America have perpetrated wickedness on humanity. It is a deviation from their foundational first principles and not the principles themselves that are at the root of any evil actions on the part of the West or America. Now, since the publication of The Vanishing West, the condition of the moral core of American higher education has worsened. Not only has the selective historical blindness toward American history and Western civilization continued to be pervasive, but this selective historical blindness has been replaced with an aggressive, if not militaristic, imposition of a new moral core educating students in an alternative moral tradition. I call this revolutionary oppression studies. This imposition has been brilliantly expounded, I think, by Stanley Kurtz in the Lost History of Western Civilization, a 2020 report also from the National Association of Scholars. Kurtz details not only the evisceration of the received Western tradition in American academia, particularly at Stanford, but also the installation of an educational ethos and core that presupposes a socially contingent reality, not an objective reality. While the vanishing West alerted Americans concerning the replacement of Western civilization and American history courses by world history courses, another more corrosive replacement was simultaneously occurring in American colleges and universities. This corrosive replacement was twofold. First, the received tradition of Western civilization and American history began to be defined as systematically and thoroughly oppressive, racist, and evil with no redeeming value. Second, this received tradition had to be replaced with other diverse moral traditions not committed to an eternal, true, beautiful that sought the complete destruction of the West and America so that a new space for a more humane social order could be created. These were definitions occurring in American higher education for many years without any significant intellectual self-assessment on the part of their advocates. To ask these advocates a question or suggest that a responsible and thorough self-assessment is needed amounts often to calls of oppression and racism. This is the high mark of anti-intellectualism in American higher education. It can be of no surprise that as this new anti-intellectual moral core has drifted further and further from the true beautiful and good, the teaching of virtues has become increasingly absent from America's most elite institutions replaced with courses antithetical to virtue, freedom, tolerance, and civil discourse. This fall, for example, Washington Lee University, one of America's oldest and most distinguished universities, is offering a freshman class entitled Writing Seminar for First Years, How to Overthrow the State, which places each student at the head of a popular revolutionary movement aiming to overthrow a sitting government and forge a better society, and requires a manifesto or an essay rewriting history. Yale University has eliminated courses in art history and English literature to decolonize degree requirements with other colleges and universities offering courses in the white in the power of whiteness, racial capitalism, queering God, and how to stage a revolution at MIT. In the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University, America's most innovative university, according to U.S. News and World Report, removed its dean and the work of several of its journalists simply for publishing content deemed too friendly to the police an institutional bastion of the West. Now, there are numerous other examples across the American higher ed landscape, illustrating both the marginalization and elimination of the Western and American moral tradition from the education provided at our colleges and universities. America's college classrooms are now resembling engineering laboratories for revolution, 
where teaching and campus life focuses on transforming students into radical, violent activists. Now, a blueprint for reform. Reviving American higher education will require reforms that address the anti-intellectual moral crisis of American academia through both moral correction and meaningful accountability. Two simple inter and interrelated initiatives should inform a new reform movement to revive American higher ed. First, the reintegration of the true, beautiful, and good within a campus-wide demonstrable context of pervasive and consistent open inquiry as a universal outcome of study in general and campus life education frameworks. And number two, an incentivized framework of transparency and accountability that provides or removes funding from colleges and universities that fail to sustain and protect this reintegration. Now the reintegration of the true, beautiful and good or hereafter truth is an educational outcome of general education and campus life education grounded upon a demonstrable commitment to open inquiry is central to correcting and healing the maladies that currently infect American higher education. As argued earlier, the very existence of an American constitutional republic upon which American universities are dependent is contingent upon the principles that arise from a Western understanding of the true, beautiful, and good. This reintegration presupposes that truth and knowledge are not socially contingent, are noble universal objects of reality are essential pillars of the moral education to which colleges and universities are openly committed and are foundational to a flourishing nature, nation and world. This in practice would entail general and campus life educational curricula that fairly and openly consider the breadth and depth of approaches to truth and knowledge while not being myopically fixated on the greatness of oppressed traditions or perspectives and the evils of the oppressor tradition, namely the West in America. To resituate general and campus education curricula would also entail an approach that grounds human evil as a universal reality infecting all humans, cultures, and civilizations everywhere, and not just a particular people group, culture, or civilization. Just as truth and knowledge are, are certainable object worthy of pursuit, so too is evil ascertainable and an object worthy of identification and rejection. This reintegration must also entail a comprehensive requirement for all American colleges and universities to ensure that all of their students are thoroughly and fairly exposed both to the enduring greatness and failings of Western civilization and American history. This is an essential aspect of the moral formation and education provided to our college students. American higher education will be radically transformed for the good of the nation if this reintegration were implemented. Now, this reintegration would also require a framework of transparency and accountability to support, incentivize, and ensure that American higher education institutions actually implement, sustain, and protect related educational outcomes. The outcome of this framework should be the establishment, nurture, and protection of a true culture of open inquiry on the campuses of American colleges and universities. The marginalization, demonization, and elimination of the received moral tradition of Western civilization in the United States cannot be allowed in American colleges and universities that claim tax exempt status due to their educational purposes. Truth, freedom and open inquiry are essential preconditions for moral formation and education. Now, if American colleges and universities reject these, then such institutions are no longer educational in nature. They resemble indoctrination camps and their tax exempt status should be reclassified at both state and federal levels. Transparency in higher education can significantly shift the direction and viability of universities. It introduces a level of market discipline to educational institutions that too often operate in a vacuum. As a case in point, consider the potential effect of gainful employment transparency measures on institutions of higher education in America. The mere transparency data requirement in a school's performance related to the measure appears to be correlated to the propensity of a program or college to close. Similarly, American colleges and universities should be required annually and publicly to report on an education, American history, history and freedom measure that would assess the level to which any college or university integrates a comprehensive exploration of truth and a balanced exploration of the Western American tradition as educational outcomes, including the pervasiveness and consistent integration of free and open inquiry throughout a college campus. 
the creation of such a measure requires much thought and collaboration along with an exploration of measures already in existence that attempt to gauge a society's freedom and democratic health. All colleges and universities should be held accountable at both the institutional and programmatic level with potential rewards and penalties as it relates to federal and state tax subsidies, student loan eligibility, research grant funding, tax exempt status, and accreditation recognition. Now, lastly, the suggested framework of transparency and accountability should also involve the revitalization and use of accrediting agencies as instruments of a vibrant civic society. The accreditation of a college, university, or academic program signals a basic modicum of quality based upon the principles of accreditation of a regional or specialist accreditor. To these principles of accreditation should be added comprehensive accreditation standards that require colleges, universities, and programs to demonstrate an institution's performance in the education, American history, and freedom measure. Further, accrediting bodies must also ensure that colleges and universities uphold their own mission statements. This is very important. This is a critical aspect of the granting of accreditation to any higher educational institution. Regional accreditors situate mission integrity as a comprehensive requirement without which an institution cannot be accredited. Accrediting agencies require American colleges and universities to be grounded in a mission that is comprehensive, appropriate for higher education, addressing both teaching and learning, and that guides the institution's operations and demonstrates commitment to the public good. Now consider, for example, the mission statements and objectives of the following accredited universities, all of which are expected to advance missions that are fully educational and serve the public good. And yet each of the following institutions is also guilty of rejecting the Western American tradition while simultaneously indoctrinating students to a revolutionary action in curricula and campus life activities. Stanford University, to qualify students for direct usefulness in life, to promote the public welfare by teaching the blessings of liberty regulated by law and inculcating love and reverence for the great principles of government is derived from the inalienable rights of man to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Washington and Lee, to provide a liberal arts education to develop students' capacity to think freely, critically, and humanely, and to conduct themselves with honor, integrity, and civility. Providence College, a Catholic Dominican liberal arts institution committed to academic excellence in pursuit of the truth, growth and virtue, and service of God and neighbor. Accrediting organizations must hold American colleges and universities accountable to uphold their own institutional missions and to fully uphold the principles of accreditation which are said to protect and promote educational equality for the public good. Accrediting bodies, a civic organization within civil society can have a profound influence on the direction and quality of American higher education through incentives and sanctions related to accreditation decisions affecting an institution's reputation and viability in the marketplace. As difficult as, may, as it may appear for these types of reforms to be implemented, it is crucial that an aggressive and comprehensive reform effort commence and that pessimistic inertia not become that to which one defaults. It is incumbent upon any American that cares deeply about the relationship of education and the well-being of the American Republic to support and advance a collaborative reform effort to redirect and revive American higher education for the foreseeable future. Our universities and colleges, our students, and our democracy need this renewal now more than ever. Thank you, and I'll give it back to you, David. Thank you so much. And I will uh, quickly pass it on to uh, uh, Adam Kissel uh, for Department of Education Perspectives. Thank you. Thanks to NAS and all the folks uh, at NAS who've invited me. I'm a life member of the National Association of Scholars, and I'm proud to say that frequently. And some of what I have to say is a follow on to what I said at the NAS conference a couple of years ago when I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Higher Education Programs, and we were talking about what the Education Department was going to do about accountability program by program versus what had happened in the past in these broader measures of whether a college is worth going to. And what I wanna do, however, uh, before I get into that, 
is mention that when I have writing students and I give them advice about what to do, lesson one is always follow the directions. And so the directions that I got for this talk were to be speculative, not about what the Department of Education is doing, but what it might do and what the kind of people who are on this call might think about and do in response. So that's what this next 15 to 20 minutes is about. And it, it, my comments fall into three broad categories. One is non-discrimination and civil rights. One is a tax on private colleges and universities and especially for-profit private colleges and universities. And third, briefly, I'll mention the free speech executive order and what I think will happen, which is not much. So first about non-discrimination, a term that I believe you will start to hear often. And so this is the 98% chance. This is the Biden administration, 98% chance of, there might be a 2% chance or, or less of not having that, but this is what we're talking about. So in the Biden administration where he is selected and secretary of education, we're very likely to keep hearing the word equity. And this is a word you already hear all over higher ed. It is a key part of the mission of the education department and it affects a lot of what happens in the education department. But I would ask you to look out for ways that the education department talks about equity and then has solutions for inequity that are themselves inequitable. And you probably know that from watching some of the other programs. And so in this area, let's start with Title IX. So some of you may remember going back to 2011 when Vice President Biden at the time uh, had a big push to change the rules for campus quasi-judicial proceedings in cases of sexual misconduct. And there was a Dear Colleague letter that had some pretty strict uh, rules that were simply declared. So a guidance letter saying, here's how we interpret Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. Here are all the things you have to do and the things you may not do as an educational institution. And if you fail to do or not do those things, we might take your federal funding away. And it was simply declared. And it violated the Administrative Procedure Act, which says if you're gonna pass rules like that, you have to provide notice and comment to the public and especially those who are going to be affected by the rule. None of that happened. But you might also remember that although nonprofit organizations that were not colleges fought pretty hard against it, it was impossible to get a single college to go sue the education department to vindicate its academic freedom and rights to adjudicate cases the way they thought they should adjudicate them. Those who fought back even a little bit were cracked down on even more severely. So even though it was an Administrative Procedure Act violation to simply declare the rules, no college or university would risk its federal funding by sticking its neck up, sticking its head up and putting its neck out uh, to be cut off. So it fell to nonprofit organizations that were not colleges to fight it. And in 2016, when something very crazy happened and a president got elected who put in an education secretary who was skeptical of her own department in its own existence, and libertarians like me started to get hired into the education department, we had a chance to change some of the worst policies that had happened under the Obama-Biden administration. So we did, and we did it right. So immediate, almost immediately, we rescinded that 2011 guidance, and we put in our own guidance, which we thought was better. It was still not using the Administrative Procedure Act, but nobody sued the education department over that. The rules were better and more fair. But then we did it right. We followed the APA. We did the notice and comment process. It took about two years. And then finally, I think this year, the final regulations came out. So we expect and should expect that the Biden administration will try to undo that. If the Biden administration again says, you know what, we'll just throw out those regulations and pass some new guidance that's interim until we can get some new regulations in there, Will there be colleges? Any will Regent maybe do it? Uh, Penn won't do it for sure. Uh, will there be some who will sue and say, you're not allowed to do that? Will it fall again to nonprofits? I think it will. Will they have standing? I don't know. So the ACLU just lost a case for not having standing fighting the current 
regulation on Title IX. So there are some interesting questions to face in the Title IX area, but I think we should not at all be surprised that those kinds of moves will happen. If the Biden administration instead says, you know what, we wanna to try to do it right from the beginning, we'll pass some new regulations. Now they're gonna be in this two year notice and comment period themselves. What that means is several steps and you can go and look at how all of that APA regulation procedure happens. But the result uh, towards the end is you get something like 100,000 comments from around the country and you have to show that you have read and understood them as the agency and that the reason that you have come up with the final regulations is that you've thought about everyone's objections, you've answered them, and this is what the regulation should be. So we did that at the education department. My colleagues at the Office for Civil Rights did it and they're winning in court because they did it right. I am not sure, in fact, I think it'll probably be the case that the Biden administration will not do it right, they'll cut corners, they'll try to get it out quickly, and then we'll be into lawsuit territory again, and it will be a challenge. But before that, they probably have to rescind the first regulations, but they may not have to. Someone who knows administrative law better than I am can tell me. But it's going to be a challenge because they, the education department already went through that first 100,000 comments. So for an agency to now say, we don't like that old rule, here's the new rule, they need to come up with a, a responsible reason that's not arbitrary and capricious why their interpretation is better than the one that's already out. And that's a lot of opportunity for folks on this call to send uh, their comments in when the time comes. So that's Title IX for now. I'll take questions about that uh, if there are some in the Q&A. Part two is, as Professor Gilly was talking about, the executive order on stereotyping and scapegoating by race and sex. I think the challenge here, because that's a, well, I should explain what that is for those who maybe missed the session. Uh, the executive order says, if you are a government contractor or a government vendor, and that includes lots and lots of US colleges and universities, you may not teach your staff in ways that are divisive, that scapegoat or that stereotype by race or sex. And the executive order explains in some detail what those terms mean. So this does not in any way affect the teaching of college students. It doesn't say that you lose your funding if you teach your students a certain way. It does say, however, that if you teach your faculty members or your staff a certain way, you are in violation of the executive order, you're gonna be in trouble. So I think it's gonna be important at a time when that executive order may be rescinded. If it's rescinded the first day, there's not a lot that can happen, but we have a few months to set the stage. And one is to not overstate what that EO says. So right now that EO is being wildly misinterpreted to say, oh, that means we can't teach about diversity or equity and inclusion. Like we can't even say that any of that stuff is happening in America. That's just totally false. If you are scapegoating or stereotyping by race or sex and you're teaching your faculty or staff to do that, that is specifically what's wrong. And so if you wanna rescind that, you're saying, okay, I guess it's okay to scapegoat by race and to stereotype by sex or vice versa. So I think that's the key argument that our side, uh, so far as we're aside, one, would wanna make that first of all, if that's what you wanna do, that's what you're doing. And second of all, that kind of conduct probably already violates labor law and is probably discriminatory in itself. So it's pretty much just saying, we don't want you to have government money if you're already gonna be breaking the law. So we can fill that out again in longer essays. Part three in this part one is um, sex discrimination that's already happening in colleges and universities. So Mark Perry, who was mentioned earlier today at Michigan, uh, and now I have been filing lots of sex discrimination complaints against colleges and universities that are already discriminating on the basis of sex in their educational programs. So you don't need the EO for that. You can simply file a discrimination complaint to the Office for Civil Rights at the Education Department. So Mark started a long time before I did, a couple of years ago, and he has seen a couple of hundred complaints get taken seriously having favorable resolutions for many of them. And a lot of them are not yet 
done. So what's going to happen in the new administration? Well, I think that a lot of these will be left to languish. So, the, so an example, so there'll be uh, women in business program or, or women in science or STEM or girls in STEM. And it will say, if you're a woman, this is for you. If you're a girl, this is for you. Sometimes it will go so far as to say no boys allowed, no men allowed, but a lot of them simply advertise and that's already uh, unlawful enough saying that we are for women. This is really for women to do this with other women and learn some things. So you're being excluded from an educational program as a woman or as a girl. So I think the education department's OCR will say, yes, internally, these are problems, but this isn't a high priority. We have to do all this other Title IX work and they'll just never get to it. And so this is now for people who know the law better, what do you do when an agency refuses to act and its own guidelines say, we need to have cases resolved in a certain amount of time. That's where uh, there may be not just legal redress, but for the people on this call, a lot of uh, moral redress and a lot of writing about the discrimination that's happening and is not being addressed by OCR. Part four, you might remember that at the very beginning of the Trump administration, there was uh, transgender guidance that had come out from the previous administration that was re removed and that involved a few different agencies. I think that guidance will probably come back. I think there's not much that anyone can do because of a few things. One is the Supreme Court has continued on a path of uh, letting the definition of sex not just mean sex. And I think there was a court recently that said HHS was not even allowed to define sex as sex. And so it's just gonna keep happening. I don't think there's a lot that can happen. If you come from a libertarian perspective, you might think this is good anyway, uh, but it's gonna really start to crack down on private colleges uh, that are religious colleges that have an exemption on in that area, but are gonna be perceived as not deserving that exemption and cracked down on. You'll remember maybe at the very end of the Biden administration, there was a very terrible document that came out, I think from the Justice Department saying, this is special treatment for religious colleges that wanna have uh, a traditional understanding of sex. And we don't think they should have that anymore. That's a brief version of a long report. So I think we're gonna see a lot more movement there. And that is where I, I think we can do something and say, no, no, religious colleges do have that exemption. So I'll, I'll cut there after the top four in non-discrimination and equity. I'll move into private and especially for-profit colleges. I have about seven minutes left. So first there and second are two big regulatory packages that maybe you heard about. One is called gainful employment and one is called borrower defense. The education department uh, redid the borrower defense regulations, but those will start to come back. And the main reason that they were there was to stop the worst of the for-profit institutions that really were defrauding students. And so that became an attack on all for-profit institutions and to some degree private institutions that they didn't like. And the for-profits were asked to post bonds uh, or if not a bond, something like a bond saying, if we have to give all the money back for all the tuition from the past few years, we need to show that we have enough money to do that. So of course that puts you out of business if you can't actually use the tuition money you've gotten for a full or two academic years. So things like that will come back. For gainful employment, this was a university-wide ratio of how much money are you getting after college in your job versus how much debt you have from your college loans. And if you fail on that measure and you were a for-profit institution across your students, you would be driven out of business too, I think. So we at the education department rescinded the whole thing, but we said, and this is what I said at the NAS conference, you know, it's actually not necessarily a bad idea from a consumer point of view to have program level data and say, if you're gonna major in journalism or women's studies or law, and you wanna compare what those our pre-law and you want to me measure what those outcomes may be for you and compare them even at your own college as you're thinking about it, it would be great to know. So that's basically what happened with the college scorecard. And then another interesting thing happened. 
my colleague at Texas Public Policy Foundation, where I also wear a hat, named Andrew Gillen, has started putting out reports, and you can find them at the TPPF website, on what he calls the GEE, the Gainful Employment Equivalent. So it's not a government-sponsored assessment of how well those programs are doing, but it's a private assessment using the same ratio kind of measure. And he is finding that lots of, not just for-profit, because he, that's already been looked at, but nonprofit, public and private university and college programs are failing and all over the country. So the argument should be, if you really wanna bring back gainful employment, don't treat for-profit differently, don't be inequitable for them, but go after programs equitably, for-profit, nonprofit, public and private. Uh, maybe I'll leave that part there now too, so that we, I don't go over time. And then quickly on free speech, you may know about a year and a half ago, the president had this free speech executive order saying that if you lose a free speech case in a court of law, if a judge has said to a public university, you have violated the first amendment or to a private university, you have violated your own promises to your students, which was mentioned in the previous, uh, by the previous speaker, then you're gonna start facing consequences. And it's up to the education department to decide what those consequences are. And I think in a Biden administration, once again, what we're gonna see is slap on the wrist at most and a long process where uh, it's very easy to overcome and redress the deficiency. You say, yep, I lost in court, but now we have a new policy. We're not gonna do that anymore, sorry. And that'll be the end of it. I think that might've happened in a second Trump administration anyway, but depending on who's in charge. But if it's a Biden administration, we are not gonna see enforcement of that executive order to the level that it ought to be enforced. So I think the main themes we're gonna see in a Biden education department, one are lots of talk of equity, but lots of inequity and inequity in terms of race and sex, inequity in terms of for-profit colleges versus others. Uh, for example, we're not going to see more permission to convert for-profits to nonprofits. They're going to say, you're, you're not really a nonprofit, so we won't let you do it. Second, uh, we're going to see lots of slow action on complaints that, say, the right cares about, which would be actual sex discrimination against men on behalf of women, actual problems in Title IX, and actual problems in free speech. So uh, unfortunately, I think we don't have a lot to look forward to that's positive out of a Biden uh, administration education department, but hopefully I have given along the way a few ideas about how we can at least rhetorically fight back and maybe even legally fight back. Thank you so much. And I'm going to uh, go. So, sorry, Amy. Yeah, uh, I, it's a little confusing because I my name is up here twice, but is can everybody hear me? Yes, Amy, we can. Everybody can see me? Yes. OK. Um, let me just put myself here on speaker view. I'm not registering that. Uh, for some reason, but doesn't matter. If everybody can hear me and see me, then uh, that's fine. Um, so my charge on this panel is to talk about the faculty's perspective on the future of higher education uh, under a Biden administration. That's what teachers and instructors and professors like me are on the front lines of the university system can expect in the next four years. Uh, my short answer is essentially more of the same, only worse. In other words, nothing good, nothing positive. So in this respect, I guess I'm echoing Adam Kissel's uh, verdict here. Uh, indeed, I think a Biden administration is a disaster for higher education uh, for many of the reasons that, um, that Adam Kissel has detailed and more, which I will uh, talk about. 
Now here I'm referring to people like me, but of course most people in academia are not like me in an important respect, and that's part of the problem. The professoriate is overwhelmingly populated by Democrats, people on the left, increasingly uh, the progressive woke social justice warriors. Uh, they're more and more common and they've staged quite a takeover. And most people in this monoculture are quite happy with the election of Joe Biden if they're not exactly jubilant uh, because he's not radical enough, they're at least relieved. <clears throat> But for people like me who don't uh, share these sentiments, there is a lot of cause for concern. I think it's fair to say that there's no place in the country where Trump and his supporters are more despised than in the universities. Uh, for four years, Trump derangement syndrome has certainly reigned supreme in my institution, and that's not an exaggeration. And it's profoundly shaped the climate in many others as well. Shortly before the election, this recent election, I asked a student here at Penn if any student on campus would dare to openly declare support for Trump and her answer was unequivocal and adamant. The answer is no. From my own experience and that of a lot of people I know, I can say this applies to the faculty as well. Only someone with an academic or social death wish would openly admit to being a Trump supporter. Now, this is not surprising. Sociologist Eric Kaufman recently wrote in City Journal that self-censorship of unpopular or right-leaning opinion is pervasive and rampant in the academy today. It's virtually complete, in fact. This intimidation effect is largely implemented through social media, through peer effects, and the academic leadership offers little or no resistance. And of course, it is, it is very hard to combat this sort of informal, uh, informal regime. The real question is whether Biden's election will make any difference to this self-censorship or make it worse. Now, one possible answer is it will not really make that much difference because it's so bad already. Uh, also, the atmosphere of intolerant partisanship and everything that goes with it are predominantly institutional and cultural, the product of ideology rather than governmental law and policy. And of course, this trend preceded Trump. So, you know, how can Biden make it that much worse? But to the extent that official policy and governmental action does play a supporting role, I think these developments will deepen and accelerate uh, under a democratic regime. And this is true for both public and private universities. So far to my disappointment, and I think to many other people's disappointment, many state houses and legislatures that are controlled by Republicans and might be in a position to reign in their public university systems have not scored many notable successes for a lot of complicated reasons. I think most citizens are unaware of the corruption and partiality of the university system of what's really going on there. And that astounds me every time I see evidence of it, but it's really true. Or they don't care, or they believe education, more education is always better. And I think that sentiment is very strong. Now on the federal front, as we've heard earlier, at least the Trump administration has tried to push back in some ways, mainly through the power of the purse, Title VI, Title IX. Uh, and one truly bright spot, as already noted, has been the reform of guidance on Title IX procedures uh, in which the NAS is heavily involved. And that of course affects faculty quite critically because faculty are not infrequently accused of Title IX infractions of various kinds. And there are also the investigations and the lawsuits challenging affirmative action programs, the Harvard case in which there's an appeals court decision just came down today and the recent probe of Yale's practices. And finally, the Trump DOE has uh, quite smartly launched an investigation into Princeton's claims uh, of pervasive racism at the school and threatened to cut off funds until they proved otherwise. I would have liked to have seen that initiative expanded to other schools, 
with funds cut off more aggressively and peremptorily. Um, obviously, under Biden, these initiatives will cease. They will be de-emphasized. They will be rolled back. Uh, I think uh, Adam made that very clear, and I agree with that. Uh, this is, of course, none of these have, have culminated in outright success, but I think they're very important, these Trump initiatives. They've been very valuable because they signal to universities and students and faculty that not all voters share their vision, and of course, communicates to voters that the administration represents their point of view uh, and has their back. But many aspects of university life that daily affect the atmosphere that faculty operate in are still very hard to penetrate through official action. And here I'm talking about those subject to internal professional administrative regulation and of course peer pressure. And I can predict these will continue on their current trajectory uh, with more of the same on the most troublesome trends. And of course, what are we talking about here? More anti-Western and anti-American scholarship and notions, obsession with diversity, equity, and inclusion, the growth of administrative apparatus, the denigration of the meritocracy, the denigration, the disregard of due process, the penalties of deplatforming, of heterodox opinion, hiring of more progressive minority scholars and teachers, which deepen the monoculture, and of course, the outright catering to minority students and other constituencies with victim status. Here in the Philadelphia area, a strike at Haverford College just ended with the administration there essentially capitulating to all demands. Now, it's interesting that there are some academics and pundits on the left who have predicted a move to more balance and tolerance if Biden wins the election. People like, who consider themselves classical liberals like Steven Pinker, Jonathan Rauch, Mark Lilly, Yasha Monk, the founder of a new website called Persuasion, have stated that Trump's departure will strengthen the ability of classical liberals within the party to fight wokeness, not just in the universities, but in other centers of cultural power. Now, in my opinion, this is sheer fantasy. I do not believe for a minute that any of this will happen. Indeed, I think quite the opposite will occur. The forces of wokeness will be emboldened and they will, uh, they will tighten their grip. I predict that the Biden administration will do nothing to push back against racial preferences and illiberalism on campus and either signal their improve approval or simply ignore the practices that are already underway. And I predict somewhat bolder and more widespread use of new devices to silent debate and dissent on sensitive topic. And what devices am I talking about? And here I'm gonna focus on some uh, developments on campus that have a specific impact on faculty, on teachers and professors. In particular, I'm concerned about the growth and spread of various ideological litmus tests and loyalty oaths, which of course are especially destructive of diverse opinion among faculty and would be faculty including the pipeline of undergraduate and graduate students who aspire to academic careers. Now, how do these, these loyalty oaths, these devices operate? Well, of course, first there's the admission process and at the graduate and undergraduate level, which involves the evaluation of applicant activities, um, evaluates their statements for commitments to diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and their embrace of the anti-racist social justice agenda. Second, through the faculty hiring process, there's plentiful opportunity to limit the hiring of those who display the wrong political caste and attitude towards sacred priorities through their application statements, through scrutinizing their past activities, their research, the company they keep, perhaps uh, the nonprofits that they've worked for, or the think tanks, and of course, their research agendas. All of that information is 
made available. And finally, through the tenure process, which evaluates and monitors scholarship, opinions, unapproved opinions, and crime think or projects judged inferior, unscholarly, or unacceptable in the left-leaning academy uh, can get people uh, excluded or get tenure denied. And of course, all of these judgments are highly politicized. And the ability to make these judgments comes uh, through the self-governing quality of our universities, right? Now, another ploy I predict will increasingly be used to control opinion among faculties is to strip teachers of their teaching duties on the theory that their presence in the classroom is traumatizing or upsetting for students and especially minority students or any other designated vulnerable group. Most recently, Greg Christensen, an economist at the University of California who uses data on IQ differences uh, in his research, has been accused of embracing eugenics and labeled therefore unfit to teach. I myself was stripped of my first year civil procedure class after I made remarks about affirmative action and minority achievement. Now the beauty of removing professors from the classroom is that it allows deans and administrators to penalize, stigmatize, and above all, undermine the influence of professors who cannot easily be fired because of tenure or contractual restrictions. So it's a way to get around the legal and institutional protections that some professors might have that secures academic freedom. Now, finally, what about tenure, which of course belongs to a shrinking number of people who teach in universities these days, that has generally been regarded as the last bastion of academic free thought, though to riff off Freud, the tenured professoriate has taken very little advantage of it. Uh, and it's uh, a ready mechanism for pushing back against a political orthodoxy. But I predict, I fear, that tenure will suffer serious erosion in the coming years as emboldened progressive academics seek to stamp out dis dissent and consolidate their monoculture. Here's the problem. The new generation of woke students and young faculty and graduate students has less and less respect for tenure, for academic standards, for academic freedom and free speech, and for all the traditional incidents and elements of university life. For, get, for them, the academy is just another oppressive, exploitative, racist, white supremacist uh, institution, no different than the rest of our rotten society, and it must be dismantled. And tenure is but one pillar of this fatally flawed system. So far, most left-leaning professors have hesitated to deploy the progressive agenda to erode tenure protections. And I think that self-interest is as play here. They know that tenure is an important perk and a safeguard for lefties should the political wind shift. But it's not clear to me how long their resistance can hold out against the mo most radical elements and politically correct and craven administrators. In fact, a close examination of tenure standards at many institutions reveals that they often have language and vague residuary clauses uh, that permit termination for words or actions that quote, run contrary to or fail to align with the interests and purposes of the university. And that might enable the exclusion of troublemakers who resist the core values of diversity, inclusion, and equity, and all the rest of the litany. So there is some potential there to seriously undermine uh, the protections of tenure. In fact, this type of move is being threatened against the aforementioned Greg Christensen, who has been accused of taking positions at odds with the anti-racist priorities of the University of California. Now, whether this accusation will amount to anything uh, for him or for anybody else, 
remains to be seen, but there is no question that his continued employment and the employment of those like him who dare to question the orthodoxy is under pressure from administrators, students, fellow professors, and even some alumni. And certainly that is and continues to be true of me. There are many calls to fire me uh, and uh, those calls are out there. They have not abated. Now, just finally, the other big factor uh, in higher education relevant to uh, faculty and their atmosphere is money. COVID has already cost the system a lot. Enrollment is down. Some institutions have scaled back or cut back on their graduate programs. Fewer professors are being hired, at least for now. And to the extent that new people are being brought on board, the priority goes to the anti-racist diversity and inclusion agenda. And under Biden, I would not expect to see uh, any change in that. Now, this is bad news for groups without victim status, especially white males and those with a more traditional academic agenda. The prospect for greater ideological balance in academia is even further dimmed, I think, by uh, this belt tightening and by these developments. So just to sum up, in my mind, Biden's election, whatever else it betokens, can only be regarded as a negative development for higher education. Uh, exactly what will happen uh, depends on how boldly the universities press their advantage, how aggressively they interpret their supposed mandate uh, in the wake of the election, and whether money continues to come their way, uh, and also whether there will be any effective forces that push back against them, either in the cultural sphere uh, or in the courts. Uh, and of course, uh, much of this has been discussed and it's uh, unknown unknowns, but I am not optimistic about any of these trends. Thank you. And thank you so very much. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. We're now going to switch to uh, the question and answer uh, portion of this. Um, oh golly, let me see. There's a bunch of different questions. Um, this is, I guess, a question which from Dave Porter to all three. Um, uh, give, given the bleak prospects of Department of Education or executive support for reestablishing our marketplace of ideas, is there hope from other sources such as the courts or non-governmental organizations such as AAUP, FIRE, or happily, the NAS? I'd like to go first, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I was in charge of the First Amendment protection program at the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education for five years. So I've been thinking about, which is FIRE, one of the groups mentioned, and I've been thinking about what to do for a long time. And FIRE's board chairman at the time, Harvey Silverglade, said, you know, it's really about the culture of the institution. And all of us outsiders are telling the insiders what to do, and that never changes the culture. So I have a piece that's coming out from the American Enterprise Institute once people can focus on something other than the election in print, which talks about, uh, about five ways to work on the culture of an institution that are different from having a court or an executive body or a legislature come in and tell you and wave the finger at you and tell you what to do, because that's not gonna make a long-term difference. Thank you. Does anybody else want to answer that question also? Yeah, I mean, I think organizations like FIRE are just invaluable. I mean, thank goodness for FIRE because it's done uh, yeoman's work here and uh, it does push back against some of the more egregious uh, abuses. Uh, but once again, I agree that it, you know, much, many of the obstacles are institutional and internal to institutions. Uh, I think it can't be overemphasized how much peer pressure, uh, how important peer pressure is. We have students coming up from K through 12 who have literally been indoctrinated 
in all of these bad ideas and a very noisy and aggressive subcontingent of them who are social justice warriors and willing to go after their fellow students in a very aggressive ways online and the like. And the administration is mum about it. The administration says not a word. My conservatism class was trolled uh, a recording that shouldn't have been made of it was trolled by um, the National Lawyers Guild chapter at Penn Law. The students downloaded it and went, went trolling through it trying to find incriminating statements made by other students. And when I brought this to the attention of the dean's office, their attitude was basically, oh, we would never, we would never remonstrate with these uh, National Law Guild students because they're lefties, they're minorities, uh, we, we're implicitly basically on their side. Uh, so until there's you know, action, and I don't mean necessarily punitive action, but at least just administrators stepping up and telling students that this kind of behavior is unacceptable, that it is inappropriate in an academic setting, uh, nothing like that is happening. Nothing like that is happening uh, the peer-to-peer -peer intimidation is allowed to go on unchecked. David, I'd like to add to this a couple of things. One, I think the importance of protecting the marketplace of ideas in terms of the viability of faith-based religious higher educational institutions is very, very important to the conversation. Uh, to a large degree, maybe public institutions are, have gone down a road that's going to be harder to rectify. So I do think that those institutions are faith-based that take, take this very serious, the freedom, open inquiry, um, a marketplace of ideas should be protected. And I think some of Adam's comments before, I think are very important for that when it comes to what a Joe Biden administration could do. Uh, second, I do think this has been mentioned throughout the afternoon. Peter mentioned this earlier. Uh, to a large degree, some of this has to be at the grassroots level. Uh, I think working at the state and local level will be very important in, in various states in, in our country. Um, number one, number two, I do think, and sometimes this is anathema to academics, but I do think accrediting organizations have to be held accountable um, for the work they do and what they're asking institutions to do. Oftentimes it's not done. And I, I do think that presidents and board of governors pay attention to accreditors when they come to a campus. So I think working through uh, for in a reform movement sort of way to change accrediting agencies. And I think third, we need to let the public know. I, I do think that most Americans simply do not know the extent to which uh, higher education has become corrupt in so many ways. And I think we need to do a better job of, of letting the public know, uh, giving them information, lots of information, so they can make wise choices uh, uh, where they send their children and who they support and what they do to hold these institutions accountable. Truly, that is so true. And just talking to, you know, well-heeled people in New York City, the kind who throw money at, at uh, Ivy League institutions, they, they either really are oblivious uh, or they don't care about the awful things that are being taught you know, your daddy, the daddy who just wrote that huge check, he's a hideous, exploitative, patriarchal racist. You know, let's let's be clear. Uh, I, I don't know how uh, they can be un unaware of that, but they are. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have, well, a, a bunch of different comments actually from Dennis Hayes in the United Kingdom. Um, I want to sort of uh, put them together a bit and maybe extend them. What should people in foreign university systems be taking from America as you know, you know what to do, what not to do, what to prevent this? And I'm going to say I, I'm going to put this: if they're not as yet as in grips as much in the grips of the social justice warriors, what can they learn from us to protect themselves in time? And then the other way around: is there anything that's happening abroad that we can look at as a model? I, I mean, from my own perspective, I think in many ways, I think the hope of European universities and that atmosphere is America. It's American institutions. And I think we have a lot of work to do here. Uh, I, I certainly would not want to be playing by the rules of, of institutions in the UK and abroad. So I think in many ways, we have to provide an example to them. And I think it begins with moral courage. I think what NAS has been doing and other institutions have been doing to fight the fight. Um, 
it's shocking to me, as Peter mentioned this morning, the fact that only a handful of American historians have spoken out against the 1619 Project. Nothing from the American Historical Association, nothing from all the, all the historians out there in, in, in mass. So I think we have to rise up with more courage and lead this at grassroots level throughout um, and, and be an example to our colleagues and friends in Europe and beyond. I'll say briefly that we have a very well articulated set of arguments about free speech and academic freedom going back 100 years. And there, it's especially important in a place where every idea is supposed to have its chance and be articulated and, and interrogated that, that we've really tried to express that through the colleges and universities of America. Other countries without that tradition maybe need to learn from some, some of those arguments so that they can incorporate a stronger view of academic freedom and free speech at their own institutions. Uh, Amy, do you have anything you want no, to I add just, to this? Uh, I, I think we, um, the, the different settings are, are so different in their legal background, their traditions. It's hard to know. I mean, it's ironic that our country has the strongest free speech tradition uh, in, in the Anglosphere and in Europe generally. Uh, and we are, you know, so terribly afflicted by um, this intolerant monoculture. So I can't imagine that another country with a weaker tradition uh, will be able to resist. Now, maybe there are other threads in other countries that, that hold this stuff at bay. I think politically in some ways, um, there are, there are European nations like France is showing its muscle here and Germany and Austria, certainly Switzerland that um, have stronger elements of conservatism. And I mean that in the original sense of conserving, conserving traditional practices and understandings um, that, uh, and so they'll resist the more extreme forms of progressivism better. Uh, than we will. Fewer, fewer campus radicals, fewer tenured radicals. Uh, but, you know, we have our hands full here just trying to deal with uh, what we're confronting. Thank you. Um, all, all, a bunch of you have been emphasizing the, uh, the federal um, role here, and obviously Department of Education. Is there a... a can one use the state governments as any sort of defense, um, you know, for teachers, you know, uh, for students, anything that, you know, that administrators can go to and somehow get help there? Well, in my mind, the, the potential for, um, you know, once again, our system is divided into public and private and the law that applies to them and the power of the purse control over those two systems is very different. Um, but for public uh, universities, which are mainly founded by, funded by, and, and um, sponsored by states, the states, uh, and are governmental, so they're subject to the First Amendment, I mean, there's tremendous potential there to exert controls um, by just, you know, starving the beast. I mean, defunding is at the end of the day. Uh, the most powerful um, instrument that government has for controlling universities. But of course, you know, that I, I detailed some of the uh, forces that are undermining any effective control. I mean, one is these very strong traditions of academic freedom where the university uh, structures, the prof professoriate will say to the legislature, well, you're making these substantive judgments about what should be taught and how it should be taught and what sorts of um, ideas we should peddle to our students. And you're, you know, that's not really your role. That's, uh, you're gonna make yourself a laughing stock. And I think legislatures are sufficiently insecure that they uh, are convinced by these arguments. Um, also, you know, it's, un this is goes back to the problem of people not really being aware of and not wanting to know what's really going on at the universities. They love their universities. They love education. 
They don't, they're afraid to defund their university systems because they think that that's backward and that's, um, you know, deplorable and uh, it's not very prestigious or sophisticated thing to do. Um, so you have to go up against that. I mean, it's very, very hard for state actors to effectively curb some of these trends, which ultimately are cultural. Uh, you know, how do you get more traditional conservative balance into the curriculum and the syllabus? Uh, you need people in there who are willing to teach students that there's another side to many of these questions. And it's not easy to find ways to get them in there. Thanks, I, I agree with everything that Professor Wax has just said. And a big part of the solution to what she's talking about is greater transparency. That's what the program level data out of TBPF is about. And it's also, you, Texas has a law saying that all of the syllabi have to be, of the public institutions have to be published online with no password protection, no tracking. And for 10 years, people in Texas have been able to see that. Mm. And so I am recommending that Oklahoma try to do it because it's their neighbor to the South and that other states also go for greater transparency in curriculum. That's what we're paying for after all. So we should get to know what it, what's in there. Um, there, you know, the academic freedom problem will, will rear its head pretty quickly because instead of saying, you know, we're going to see legislators go after individual faculty members instead of what they should be doing, which is the whole institution and the culture of the place. On the other hand, the transparency I think will be really valuable towards solving what uh, a lot of what Professor Wax has said. Can I make one more point? And this doesn't just apply to state uh, to public universities; it can also apply to private. Um, there, you know, there has been some success, limited success with establishing these sort of institutes within universities, you know, for Western culture, for Western values. If you get a big donor, if you get, you know, the legislature like in Arizona deciding that you're going to create this, this entity. Um, the problem is, you know, you have to exert controls on who gets hired and <laughs> the people coming through graduate school I mean, these people are screened out long before they get to the point where they can be hired as junior professors. Um, there are very, very few people who get through the system who are willing to uh, adopt a more traditional approach to a lot of these topics. I'm not saying they don't exist, they exist, um, but you know, they consider the universities hostile territory. Uh, I know some at Hillsdale, some end up at places like Claremont and the like, um, and other think tanks. Um, but I really, know the Arizona State piece really well. Uh, that was in my portfolio when I worked in philanthropy. And I got to know what was happening in the legislature as well as on campus. And if you play the strategy well, you can do it. But, you're, but Professor Wax is right, the pool is not large. And it's really easy to not play it well uh, and have all your money go to exactly the opposite of what you wanted. Right. I think tra transparency is powerful. And, and, but I also, again, don't want to underestimate the, what I'll call the sort of the popular grassroots level of, of this. You know, we've gone to, the, uh, to the, our state legislature here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And, and it was amazing in some of these sessions that, that uh, state legislators do pay attention. So when an administrator or, or someone like that speaks and shares with him concerns, they will stop, they will listen. And in one particular case here, they, a number of things were actually diverted because of it. So uh, that's my comment about the importance of moral courage. I think we have to be transparent. Uh, so these measures, for example, the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, and their what will they learn studies is a powerful tool that lets Americans know here's what 1500 American universities are doing or not doing in general education. How do we disseminate that knowledge at, at the lowest level possible uh, and, and over communicate because sometimes you have to over communicate and then actually get our hands dirty at the legislative level. I mean, it's, it's hard work to do, but I remember the last time we went to our state legislature, a number of universities had sent entire classes of students 
to speak to their legislatures to change their mind. Mm -hmm. So, and I will tell you that I did not see um, many students or what, what I would consider to be uh, conservative institutions there. It was, it was, it was just the, the entire other side of the, of, the, of the aisle. So I think we have to get involved with that level as well. It's uh, it, it could beyond our traditional boundaries, but it's absolutely essential work to be done. Thank you all. Um, we're, I think, roughly at the end of our panel. Um, yeah. If any of you have any last comments, um, I would welcome them. But otherwise, um, after that, then I would uh, have us you know, have a few minutes so people can again step up before our closing remarks by NAS Chair Board Chairman uh, Keith Whitaker. Uh, any last comments from anybody? Can I just make one brief comment? This is totally pie in the sky, and it's inspired by um, a, uh, a, a comment here on the chat, many private colleges could not su survive without federal funds. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, once again, I think, you know, in, in my fantasy universe, uh, the federal government would get out of the educational loan business, which has been just a pernicious thing. It has fueled tuition increases, the expansion uh, the, the rapid expansion of the administrative apparatus. I was just reading on someone's Twitter the other day that, you know, Harvard is offering $300,000 salaries to a librarian for diversity, that diversity officers get, you know, twice as much, three times as much money as professors. I mean, that's just wildly perverse. Uh, that sort of thing is going on. And it's all fueled by these Pell grants and federal funds and the like. And just to reiterate, you know, if the Trump administration had had any balls, they would have just cut off every single private institution that issued one of these mea culpa, we are indelibly and irretrievably racist statements. Just cut them off. A friend of mine said, oh, they'd have to go through OLC and all of these channels. I said, no, they don't. Just do it. You know, I mean, it's the sort of thing that Democrats do all the time and, and worry about it later. That, that would have been wonderful, but alas, there's still time, but you know, it'll all come to an end on January 20th, supposedly. Well, thank you all so much. <laughs> thank you so much then. Uh, and alas for Alter uh, Lestri Descalier politically, I suppose. Uh, thank you so much. And um, I would uh, please everybody uh, come back in eight minutes or so, as I say, for uh, Keith Whitaker, who will be giving closing remarks for mapping higher education. So but I am just going to get off myself now. Okay, that, thank you. To... Yeah, let's just let's go ahead here. We, we oh, can wrap oh. this up. Oh, in that case. <laughs> All right, never mind. <laughs> All right, yeah. That's, um, so look, I, I, I suggest we go ahead just because my remarks will be brief and uh, I know everybody spent a long time here. I've spent the day actually as Amy Wax. I didn't realize that there were two of us uh, on the call until uh, Amy mentioned it. But uh, so I've had a chance to listen uh, as Amy. I just wish I had her wit and wisdom to share here at the conclusion. Um, but I think I'll share actually a little more positive note uh, than, than Amy ended on there as saying that the world will come to an end on January 20th. Um, not because I have any less uh, belief that uh, this possible new administration will be any worse than everyone has been saying, but because I guess I come back to some fundamental, uh, what I think political facts here. So, but first we're talking about the mapping of higher education in light of the recent election. Uh, and I want to come back to where NAS is on that map. Uh, one thing that struck me as we've gone through the day is that this has been actually, although an honest horribilis generally, for NAS has been extremely positive uh, in terms of NAS's growth, its financial strength, its policy successes that many people have talked about today, its power in shaping the debate uh, NAS has made great strides uh, over the last year. Nonetheless, the tenor of our discussion today has been generally uh, pessimistic. Uh, my, I guess I'd single as an exception uh, the uh, very genial idea that Bruce Gilley shared of reverse gatekeeping, which I think we should hold on to and consider more. Um, so why is that? We're left now with the possibility of, again, a hostile administration and our old antagonist, uh, the illiberal left firmly or even more firmly entrenched in the academy. Uh, and as we've talked today, one thing that has continually struck me is that we the people 
in this country make the academy possible, right? We give it lots of money, as many people have emphasized. We give it academic freedom. We have let it and let the illiberal left make it into an engine of revolutionary change, a very important part of the intellectual economy of the left. And why is that? Well, here I'd come back to something that precedes Trump or Biden or any politicians who are still living right now. And that is just the pragmatic bargain, as I guess I'd put it, that the American public has made with the academy. The American public doesn't look at the academy as an engine of revolutionary change. It looks at it as a counterparty, a counterparty in a deal. The public supports the academy and preserves it. And in turn, it expects the academy to deliver on very significant benefits. Uh, to the country, most specifically in the form of a rising generation that'll lead better lives than their parents and their grandparents. And I mean by better, not only as workers, but also as members of sound families and of a healthy political community. I think that kind of pragmatic bargain is why if academ academicians wish to cash big paychecks while denouncing capitalism or decenter morality while defending their status, the public is pretty content for them to, to, to tolerate these antics, just as if they were trying to extract sunbeams from cucumbers. The public in the, in the face of this bargain is unfortunately maybe for those of us who care about ideas and morals and such, they're not as interested in those topics of ideas and morals, maybe not even so much money up front in the belief that more education as Amy Wax put it is always better, right? And that fundamental belief I think derives behavior. However, I think in the face of that bargain, there are at least two points that I think the public has started to take serious notice of. First, the public, as we've seen, does not ignore and does not take kindly to seeing higher education administrations collude with foreign donors and powers hostile to the United States. And second, I don't think that the public ignores and does not take kindly to seeing higher education actually foment racial division in the cases in which classroom radicalism leads directly to riots, striking a deadly blow at the very life of the country. And so in the face of those two, I would call them actually opportunities, I think NAS as a player within this landscape has a, a real chance to continue and advance some of the good work it's done over the last year. But it'll require, as some of our speakers have said, and I'll, I'll put it even more pointedly, a more unabashedly political not Republican, not Democrat, but pro-American stance on NAS's part. And what hope do I have that that will make any difference? Well, first, certainly shutting down 50 plus Confucius Institutes across the country gives me some hope, as well does the success of the campaign against Proposition 16 in California. But I would close actually by referring back to this election that has hung over our discussion, though we've not really spent much time talking about it itself, um, I'm surprised that, I'm not surprised that it's still going on 10 days later. For this election started four years ago and it's been going on ever since. And the fundamental question that's being disputed is simple. Is America something great worth defending or is it an offense requiring cancellation? In past elections, America's defenders have tended to make our defense in apologetic tones and its detractors have tended to temper their criticism with reassuring noises. For the last four years, however, America's detractors have not generally sought to hide their contempt. And its most prominent defender, as we know, for good or for ill, never apologizes. So that means that voters had a clear choice on the fundamental question, and very nearly half chose America's goodness, even with very great reservations about the person entrusted with that good. That's a public that NAS and our allies can work with. So I guess I would close here that by saying that I don't think that the map ahead is very friendly to NIS's work, but these observations, uh, particularly around the public's reaction to foreign collusion with higher education and racial division fomented by higher education do give me hope. And I know that NAS and its staff are up to this continued journey. So I wanna close by thanking all of our speakers, all of our panelists, and especially thanking the NAS staff, NAS staff who made uh, today possible and who cultivated such a rich discussion and who are going to keep up uh, this journey ahead of us. So thank you very much, all of you, for joining us in it.